Right, I'm the boss here. Check, check. <laughs> because I'm the mature one. <laughs> it's Direct. true. He's, he, is the, he is New St. Andrews Director of Fun Time. You can ask him what that means later. Um, so, actually, we're supposed to have a roundtable discussion. We don't have a table. Tableless. A roundtableless discussion on um, raising strong sons and secure daughters. I think that was it. I got it. Okay. Strong sons and secure daughters. Um, so let me let me kick it off then with a question to you, Nate, and then hopefully we'll we'll roll from there. Um, in your in your talk, you described this sort of world that inculcates toughness, the, the scary world of challenges and whatnot that inculcates toughness. And I remember um, growing up as a Christian kid in the evangelical world, and I remember all of those things that you're describing, the various kind of scary experiences that um, sort of raise you up as a man and, and the, the challenges that are scary and sort of death-defying that grow you up. But what I remember is that all of those challenges and it seemed like to me almost necessarily came from outside of the church. So, so the world you grew up in, um, if you wanted to go somewhere that was going to test your manhood and prove something, you had to do that outside the church. And Christian men would brag about all of those things that had made them into the men they were, but they always, dis they always bragged about their, it was like their BC years, their before Christ years. <laughs> Right, and and that was that was why you had to have a testimony. You know, first it described your conversion, but it also proved your manhood. Is this the wrong time to talk about my time in a biker gang? <laughs> exactly, right. A time in the biker gang, the, the time BMX gang. <laughs> <laughs> was it's <was> legit. <laughs> the suburbs of Chicago, we rolled hard. <laughs> but but what I don't I there was no conception of how you could have that in the church. How do, you, how do you create a culture where, where you have a deep desire for faithfulness and God-honoring obedience while learning to have that kind of, while having those kinds of opportunities for growing into manhood? I think it, it requires community because those opportunities shouldn't come in the church proper, but they should come, they, they should be able to come in the church body, in the community, because we don't, we don't want the church running a peewee football league, right? You know, it's, it'd be odd to have the deacons tasked with hikes, you know, with, with the boys. Uh, that'd be, it'd be really bizarre. But when you have a community that grows and you have other like-minded believers and you share the standard for the kind of thing you're aiming at, then those opportunities present themselves. You know, we give it, you have like-minded families, and so there's opportunities to do things with those boys, with those friends, with those other families, and, and so on. I think it requires Christian community, but uh, you're absolutely right that most of the stories, I think any, anybody who's participated in athletics, any guy could tell you about how quickly Christian guys will drop a facade you know that they'll they'll have a like a, a church face and then they'll want to swap war stories a lot of them can be pretty terrible and they, it just reveals their hypocrisy but i, I remember uh playing basketball in the uk where it was there's all this mission money got spent to help us be over there and the guys on the team weren't christians you know they were it was a it was about the sport and they would require a different guy to give a testimony at, at set times, like, hey, you're going to talk to the Irishman, to the, uh, the Irish League about God and church. And all these guys were complete reprobates. And then they would, they would have to put on a face and pretend because they'd been to Christian camps before and so on. They could. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that has happened traditionally. But it's, it's been a real blessing in a community like this one where there's people committed to Christian education. And now the Christian education has gotten, well, rigorous Christian education has really spread nationally. There's a lot of opportunities. But there's still, you want to make sure you do actually intentionally provide opportunities that scare your kids, especially your boys, inside the Christian body. Because they will find those things. They're, they need them, and they're going to search for them, and they're going to find them somewhere. 
I really, I think it's very, very important for moms. It's great if you do this too, because it's generally more surprising if it comes from you. Uh, but moms and dads to drag your kids to do a thing where they're thinking, is this allowed? <laughs> like, is this, is this for real? Are we allowed to do this? Uh, and being out ahead of them, being more fun and pushing the limits uh, in a way that you, you become that uh, partner in crime or Shekinah. 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 But uh, like you, you become that ringleader where you're, you're the ringleader of this little family group and you go do things that might seem uh, crazy. What, what does it look like then as a church community to develop um, um, heroes of Christian masculinity? Because it seems like every role model that's put forward for young boys that's within the church does not actually have that kind of masculinity. Every role model for actual masculinity is outside of the church. It's an action movie or something that's, it's always something reprobate. How do we actually cultivate godly um, masculine model, um, models within the church? Storytelling. True stories, historical stories, you know, Bible stories. Like God's telling stories all the time. The Christian martyrs are real. Bear Grylls is actually a guy. <laughs> He really does that stuff. Uh, there's, I mean, you go through the Bible stories and you tell the stories for real, and you go through history and you tell those stories for real. You, I mean, you think about the people who died so that you could have a Bible in English. You know, your kids need to know that. Like, we get to see here, sit here and get our minds blown by a Bible software thing, and you remember what happened to the Huguenots, remember what happened to Tyndale. Like, when people were getting hunted down and murdered if they translated a Bible. Like telling those stories, uh, telling the stories of heroes of the faith all the way back, which is a big player in education again, right? You have to know those stories. If you don't know them, you have to learn them. Uh, you don't want the extent of your kids' Christian heroes to be professional athletes who happen to not cuss quite as much as the other ones. I would, I would just add that they need to know your story and they need to be okay with the vanilla nature of it or the, you know, what, one of the things I'm impressed by with my kids is, especially the little ones, is how much they want to just know me and my testimony. And they just want to know it. And it's not the exciting stuff at all. And I think we're, we're reluctant to share that with them because of what you highlighted, right? That it's, we sort of grew up in this testimony battle Mindset. We have to have a better testimony. So, what? Well, how does that connect with? Um, I think sharing whatever testimony you have with your kids. Your kids want to know you as their father. You have to do that throughout their life, um, even if it's even if it seems a little boring to you. The other thing I would add is, for those areas where you're looking in community to build pl dangerous places for masculine expression, they need to have the end in mind. And I don't think we do enough work around teaching our boys why they need, why hurting in basketball or sports is not about winning basketball. Right. It's about being the kind of man, kind of ruler in the kingdom of God that they need to be to sacrifice themselves for their families. These are these little, little places where they can get rep repetitions, small or repetitions at sacrifice in ways that they'll need to do when they're older. And I think. Those two things, telling them your stories and, and making sure that they know why and what they're learning in athletics. It's not about the NFL, it's not about whatever. It's about, a, it's a training ground to grow you into a masculine um, leader in God's kingdom. We need to be doing that more and more. And I don't think, I don't think we do enough yeah. of that. To just to piggyback on that in two ways. One is, one of the things I love about sports is that you're forcing your child to lose. Like there's, it's a situation in which they get to really, really want something a lot and they're guaranteed to not get it every time. Or in the case of my kids, I have to make them want it. Right. We have different yeah. kinds of kids. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have kids who like to win and kids who hate to lose. So right. there's there are a couple of different kids. My kids hate to, hate to seem like they want to win. Right. <laughs> but it's, it's the, uh, the, I think the hardest lesson the really the hardest lesson is learning to want something a lot and to put it out there and be willing to want it publicly and with 
100% of your effort and have everyone see you come up short. Like that is a, that is a glorious, glorious lesson. Uh, and of course, hopefully they'll win sometimes too, but even if they never do, they'll get, they'll get that benefit. The other thing is to, to jump back around, I was talking about telling stories from church history. I think the fundamental problem, like the root root problem of all of this is that we don't know God the Father and we don't really care to. So you all, moms especially, I'll pretend like all the dads are great on this issue, they're not, but just moms, you know you're supposed to be like God, you want to be more and more like God, and yet he makes all these creatures all over the place that you don't want to look at. Take it away. <laughs> oh, I hate those. You say about one whole wing of God's gallery. <laughs> I hate that stuff. This is, this is the God who invented centipedes and invented giant ones that eat bats while dangling off the roof of caves. And you should be excited to tell your kids about the father who made that up. Like, they should get to know the father who invented those centipedes and those bats which those centipedes are eating, who invented all of these amazing things, invented sharks and invented snakes and invented this stuff. All the stuff that you don't want brought into the house. You know, all of that, it's amazing, it's glorious. God does fantastic work with it. And he, he says, look here and shows you this entire natural world. We have the word of God, and then we have the entire natural revelation where we get to know the artist. You actually get to know your father. Your father made tons and tons of stuff, most of which will make you uncomfortable. And like, introduce your kids to that, to that personality, to the personality of their father in heaven, and that starts to kick down the doors of evangelical femininity pretty quickly. A question for you, Luke, in your, in your talk, uh, Sorry. Um, you mentioned the importance of them finding their identity, your children finding their identity in the Father, and I was thinking about just the, our, the theme of our tableless discussion here. The brothers of the round table. Yes. Being um, secure daughters, and I think about the, if, I, if I asked somebody in the world, how would you make this girl feel secure? What would you point her to? Um, it seems like the kinds of answers you would get, the way the world wants to form the identity of young women versus what you were describing seems so antithetical to that. I'm wondering if you could just contrast those a little bit. How do we, how do we miss what it looks like to point, um, point a young woman to find her identity in God the Father? Well, I mean, to Nate's point, we need to know, we need to know God the Father, not only in his natural revelation, but in the actual, in his special revelation. I don't think enough of us, well, we can all grow in how we know who, our, who God the Father is. And our kids are, God is kind to us, and our kids often rise above our level. But in some ways, we shouldn't expect their hearts and their souls to get beyond ours, if that makes sense. And I don't want that to sound like a lot of works, but if, if we're not working to grow in our understanding and our, and our ambition and imagination about who God is and what our role in this world is, then I don't think our kids will share in that. That was part of the, they, part of the talk, part of what I was trying to communicate. How we do that with daughters today, um, I'm not sure that I have a great answer for that. Uh, frankly, I can cop out on that and and say, I have an amazing wife, um, which sounds li like a cop-out. Um, so find one of those. Well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yes, men, find a good wife, and find a wife who values the things that you want your daughters to value. And the thing that I've always been impressed with, with Doug and his daughters, and seeing that I, I can see it, I've been in the family, is a real closeness and then a real um, solid identity, but that's not, it's tender, but it's not overly tender in the sense it's just not mushy. The girls are warriors too. And I think if you want that kind of daughter, that strong woman who's willing to fight um, for the kingdom in the way that women do, dad has to be doing it in the way that men do. 
And I do think there's a way in which that will work itself out. Does that make sense? On uh, this is a general comment about the Christian world and conservative Christian world, especially. Anecdotally, I have seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young Christian women who have been lied to their entire lives, and they're they're keeping up a facade of not sinning, of pretending like that doesn't like their identity is no, I'm a good Christian girl, and I I don't mess up. And for some reason, probably goes back to Queen Victoria or before, we have this comprehension that guys are idiots and they will mess up. But women are supposed to be like the Holy Spirit and they're supposed to be sanctifying everyone around them. And for them to admit, yeah, I lied. Yeah, I cheated. Is, is like a suicide. They're so wrapped up in their identities of, of being perfection that it, it, they crumble after one mistake. And so I think from a very early age, once again, be just being honest, being truthful, making sure that your, your daughters are apologizing and seeking forgiveness in, to their family members and with other people seeing, seeing them get grace, be forgiven, and be restored when they sin in a feminine way not just when Billy throws a baseball through a window and you, and you deal with him that way, but when she's got that, she's got that passive aggressive thing going, when she's, she's getting snide, when, whatever, when she's over emotional, when she loses control and snaps emotionally, that she's going to repent, name the sin, not make an excuse for it, name the sin and repent to everybody who was there and then be fully restored and you're back, just like a boy. For some reason, we lie to the girls and say, you have to be perfect forever, all the time, there's, and, there's, and you're beyond redemption if you cheated in third grade or fourth grade or fifth grade. You're beyond redemption. But this kid over here gets to play with matches like all the time, right. and he's just back boy, in the Boys fold. will be boys, right? Yeah. So um, how about, again, the theme, strong, do- or strong sons, secure daughters, I've asked the little leading questions to get us talking. Now, can you throw some things out? Just as a dad, what are the habits you cultivate in your house um, to, to instill um, those attributes in your kids? Um, I'll start, Nate, quick. Real quick, uh, I, I think that this is just an asterisk on secure daughters. It's really important that you not try to get your daughters to be submissive towards the male gender. Amen. I mean, that's, that's like shooting yourself between the eyes. <laughs> you know, it's uh, they're not supposed to be submissive to the male gender. Women are not supposed to submit to men as, like, as a class. It's not supposed to happen. And if you are doing that, if you're, if you're trying to get your daughter to be docile, then you're put an arsenic in your sweet tea. And, and the distinction is she's supposed to submit to her husband, right. which is one man, not to the world right. of mankind. She's supposed to submit to her father. She's supposed, supposed to submit to her husband when those vows are taken at some point, when the right guy is, mm. is found, but not dudes. I'm not, looking, I'm not looking for docility in my daughters. I don't want my daughters to, yeah. to feel that way towards just random guys at all. Well, good job so far. <laughs> I want him to mouth off at cops. Shout out to Amira. <laughs> Luke? You know, my, my set is a little younger, um, and I, I, I just, I go back to the security and identity, uh, and this is something that I need to grow in, because I don't walk around thinking about the stories that I, thinking the stories I have from when I was a little kid would be the best thing to tell to my kids. But for them, they, they just, they absorb it and they suck it in like, like they could, like there's an infinite absorption rate. They could continue to get it. Um, they're far more, sometimes, sadly, far more interested in me than I am in them, if that makes sense. So in terms of sec- cultivating habits for secure identity is focusing my attention on them and having those conversations. Um, and that's something that has really yielded great fruit. I'm, I'm thinking little ones. I've got, lot, I've, got, I've got more little ones. 
So Ben. Yeah. Ben, let us know about how to cultivate <laughs> these habits in your house. Well then. Um, Aha. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just straight up cheat and steal from uh, one of Doug's sermons, um, which you all are doing as well. You're just not citing. <laughs> <laughs> Logos Bible software is supposed to just footnote it for me automatically. <laughs> did, that, did that not that, show that, up? That's version 9. Uh, no, I, I remember, um, I can't even remember the series, but I remember um, Doug noting, I think it was actually something on parenting but noting um, at the baptism of Jesus and at the transfiguration, where at that moment, um, it's interesting because those are moments where um, in the Bible, from a theological perspective, people often go to prove the doctrine of the Trinity because it's the moment where you have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, all three at the same time. So it's, it disproves uh, modalism, the idea that God is sometimes showing up as a Father, sometimes showing up as Son, whatever. But what's interesting is that the, at the moment that the Father and the Son and the Spirit appear all together, what that moment looks like is the Father publicly declaring his deep love and satisfaction and pleasure in the Son. The fact that he, he, he says to the world, this is my Son right here, look at him, this is the one I love. Everybody, see that, okay? And I, I remember Doug just pointing out, like, that's really the essence of fatherhood, is, is being somebody who's just going to, you want your, your kids to always feel your pleasure. Like, they're, they're just walking in the pleasure of their father. And there's something I think that's really, um, you grow up secure when you grow up in that. And hopefully that in that, um, showing them your pleasure, what you're really showing them is what it looks like to walk in the pleasure of their heavenly father. Like the, the deep and abiding joy of walking, walking in that. I just pile on the Abba Father. I referenced that several times. The Spirit sends the Spirit in our hearts, dwells in our hearts, and we, we say Abba Father. The only other time that's not referencing the Spirit dwelling in our hearts is, is Christ Himself saying that. That when we kind of, I, I think as a, as a man and as a father, oftentimes I don't necessarily feel the pleasure of God, or rest in myself, the pleasure of the, that the Father has in me in Christ. Um, so, and if you don't, and if you believe God is not the God who's doing that, it's really hard to transfer that to your kids, to, to reflect that to your kids. Anyway. Right. I think, any, any other last tidbits before we wrap it up? To your note, I would just say, identify publicly with your children without qualification. Yeah. Amen. Like, don't add a little qualifier of what she's struggling with right now or anything like that. And again, this is me talking to somebody. I sit at a table with a pen, signing books, and moms and dads will drag kids by and tell me about their children. And it's frequently, I, I feel horrible for the kids because it's a little bit of affection and then a lot of criticism or being apologetic or embarrassed to me about Johnny or about, you know, this girl, she's reading these dumb books right now. I'm trying to get her something good. You know, it's like, just stop it. Just tell me this is your daughter and that you love her lots and I'll sign the book for her. Like just, just claim her and claim her without qualification well, it is, and it affiliate, is identify with them. It is sad how people will feel like they're actually elevating themselves by stepping on their kids. Yeah. By, by the, they're somehow gaining ground by that. You're only pushing yourself down. If you're at the basketball game, uh, we keep going to all these sports. Analogies. More sports. Yeah, but if you're at the basketball game and your son is the one who shot on your own basket, <laughs> you are proud. Did, did he make it or not? He drained it. Drained it. He nailed yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. It's just an information just, problem. Just walk <laughs> around to the other bleachers and start cheering. Just <laughs> exactly. But you don't put distance between you and your kids. You are, you are proud at every step, and it doesn't matter what's going on. You want to make sure that they, are never, you're, they never feel that you're ashamed to identify with them. So many times I hear parents say, we're working on them. We're working on them. I'm working to try to get them as cool as me. You know, it's, and that's the impression. But they, they're throwing a little bit of shade. They're putting a little bit of like, distance. And why would you expect them not to do the same? Like, they're going to start doing the same thing because in about five minutes, they're going to be cooler than you. <laughs> yeah, they and they're going to start throwing the shade the other direction. 
right. and, and create a little distance from the church, from the family, from you. So just stop, just team up with them. Yeah, if you're not, if you're not interested in your kids very quickly, they won't be interested in you. I should, uh, when you're at these book signings, I think you should start just making notes to Sally. Your mom is working on you. Sorry about your mom. Sorry about <laughs> <laughs> But we all have our burdens to bear. Amen. All right, thanks very much, guys.